Today, we'll be looking at information and communications technology, the enterprise architecture. Information and communication technology, the enterprise architecture. Uh, we will go through the world of understanding computing, basic input, output, storage, processing, and how all those fit into the enterprise architecture of an organization. We we'll also try to understand what the enterprise architecture is and how do we fit in all of these in the enterprise architecture. Just like I said, these are our learning objective for this session. We we'll also go into the world of networks and understand how networks work. Now, just like I said, what is a computer? A computer or a computing device is an electronic device that has the capacity of solving any well-defined problem based on the logic that is given to it by the computer. And just like you can see, it can accept information, it can manipulate, it can store, it can give output, it can relate with different devices, it can communicate with different devices to enhance productivity in different areas where those devices are being used. And when we talk about input, input are basically everything that takes instructions. The keyboard is an input device. Your mouse is an input device. Your optical character reader is an input device. Your optical mark uh, reader is an input device. Your magnetic character reader is an input device. The microphone is an input device. You can see even the sensors that is placed on devices that when it sends a certain signal, trigger a certain action is also an input device because what input is to computer is being redefined. Every day, there are different thinking, different research, practitioner thinking, researcher working on increasing the capacity of what the computer can do. So what was one defined as input 10 years ago, animal input, new things are coming. Your camera is an input device from different devices. The last camera is an input device because it takes picture. So output, it's what the computer give out. It could be hard copy on paper. It could be soft copy on screen. Either you choose to save it or not. So we have a whole lot of lists of input and output devices. And just like I said in one of my classes that computing is a binary driven profession. It's a binary driven profession and everything still boils down to zeros and ones. So these are some examples of uh, input and output devices. And I'm still gonna show you more of those input and output uh, devices. As you can see, these are examples of input devices. So all of us can identify with this because these are the things that we work with on a daily basis to give computer instructions, your card reader, your light pen, your phone fingerprint reader, all these are input devices. All these are input devices, your keyboard, your pointing devices, all these are input devices, your microphone, your game controller, all these are input devices, your Chica mark recognition reader, like I said, device itself, it's a reader. The job that it does is recognition. The device itself, it's a reader, and the work that it does is recognition. The keyboard has the most popularly used input devices. It's analyzed for you here. You can see all the keys on the keyboard. Function keys, num lock, numeric keypad. And if you look at your keyboard, you discover that your control key, your alternate key, your shift key are on both sides of the keyboard. They are designed like that so that you can use any one that is most convenient for you. And you know the way the computer is designed. For people that have one or two efficiency or impairment, they can shift all the functions to one side. In fact, those who have one or two impairments can reconfigure the system to be conscious of their uh, uh, deficiencies such that the little they have, they can still use the system very effectively. Now, some people who, who cannot see that are using the computer very well, they are making use of voice, they are making use of uh, all the signs that could help them. There are provision for all that on the computer. So apart from the keyboard, we will have seen every other one 
all these, even the keyboard that you have on your phone. You know, I used to ask my students, is the keyboard a hardware now or a software? In those days, it used to be a hardware. But the way it is, it is becoming more of a software. It's becoming more of a, a, a button that trigger the set of keys. And even on your system, if you look at it, if you search for it, you see on-screen keyboard. So on-screen keyboard works like any of the keyboard on our phones and the computing devices that uh, that we carry. So having spoken this much about uh, input devices, and I think we need to also learn about the output devices. We'll learn a little about network, then we'll go into the enterprise architecture and see how it fits in. Because the essence of all this is to understand all these tools and see how it helps the effectiveness of business operations such that we spend less and we gain more. And that is one of the core purpose of employing information and communication technology tools in what we do as a business owner or as an employee. Outputs are results of data that are processed that is either stored in the computer, shown to you on your screen as a soft copy or displayed through a hard copy through printer. Now you can see examples of output devices. Your VDU, that is your monitor. Sometimes it serves a dual purpose of both input and output because what you put into the computer, you see it on your VDU, you see it on your computer screen, you see it on the screen of your PDA. So at that point, it's receiving instruction, it's acting as an input device. But when processing has taken place on whatever input you put in there and it's showing you the results, it's also acting as an output device because it's an interface by which you see what you are sending and what the computer is sending back to you as a feedback or as a result of whatever operations that you might have carried out. And you can also see printers there. You can see speakers. These are examples of output uh, devices. We call them display devices. You can see several of them that shows you results of operations that have been uh, performed. And we have different kind of monitor. We have the CRT, the cathode ray tube. We have liquid crystal display, that's LCD. So you can see different type of them. Also your screen on your phone, your screen on the camera. After you take a picture, I can see that the back of the camera is also acting as an output device to show you the results of what has been done, to show you the result of what has been done and what has been uh, captured. Now, having gone into the world of input and output, which I believe you have a better understanding uh, of now. I think we can go to see, uh, say a little about processing. What does computer processing, what does it mean? Why do we need to process? How does it work? This is not trying to make us complete scientists, but it's trying to give us the understanding of the tool that we use so that we have a good grasp of what it is. And with that, we are in control of it to employ it more better in helping us to be productive, in helping us to be productive. Processing. Processing basically means the computer acting on the input we have given onto it. And that acting is taking place from different dimensions. I think we need to understand that there is an operating system on our computer, and that operating system control and coordinate all the activity that takes place on the computer. Apart from that, there are different types of applications. And the purpose of each application differ from one another. So you are given instruction using an application based on the purpose of that application software. So when those instructions are given, the computer through a central processing unit as it then works. But now there are processing units embedded in a computer. It's not as separated as it used to be. Now, there are different devices, different components that does different things. There is arithmetic and logical units that works on all instruction that has to do with logic, that has to do with arithmetic on your computer. Now, there is this law called Moore's law, and I think I can I can I can read it out. What's law Moore's law saying? Moore's law 
in summary, is saying with the use of computer, you achieve more by spending less. That the capacity of computer will keep increasing, will keep increasing, and the costs to get it will keep reducing. And that is happening today. And there's nothing else that a businessman wants other than something that will give him so much benefit, so much value, and is taking little resources from its pocket. Now, let's look at different kind of computer, the way it's categorized there. We have the mainframe, supercomputer, mini computer, microcomputer, your laptop, your smartphone, your tablet, all these are computing devices. All these are computing devices. Now, let me show you more uh, computing devices also that you need to see so that it can broaden your horizon on this concept of the computing. The size, the speed, the processing power of any computing device determine the price. And may I say at this point that anytime you are getting a computing device, decide what you want to use it for and get the one that is fit. Don't get the one that its power is too much that you're not even exploring until everything becomes obsolete. And don't get the one that the capacity is too small compared to what you intend to use it for. There are always people that could advise and guide around you and I can also be reached. You will have my phone number on the screen and my email, I can also be reached. Now, if you look at this, there are different types of computer. You can see these personal computers, mobile computers, game console, servers, mainframes, supercomputers, and embedded computers. These are computing capacity embedded in all the mechanical devices such that they function and they trigger uh, 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 action at the press of a button or even sensing an object or a transaction. So we have different kinds of computers. All these that you are seeing are all computing devices. They are all computing devices. They are all different type of computing device. Your, your smartphone, your personal digital uh, assistant, all of these are all computing devices. And in each of them, the input a, 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 a component, the output component, the processing component, the storage component are all in each of them, are all in each of them. You can see these are examples of servers and mainframes. These are examples of servers and mainframes. So having said that, you can see these are embedded computing here in a car. From the dashboard, from the press of one button, it trigger an action. These are embedded computing uh, uh, examples. So let's look at the world of storage. Let's look at the world of storage now. What is computer storage? How do computers store information? Why do we need to store? So let's explore a little the world of computer storage. The world of computer storage. Yeah. Right, storage. I know some of us can identify with some of these devices that you are seeing on my screen. Computer stores information. And those information are properly stored. It aid conservation, it aid its retriever, and it aid easy access. These are some of the advantages of storing our files electronically compared to storing it in physical component of physical files. And over time, the world of computing has witnessed different type of storage devices up until now that we are experiencing cloud storage. If you have been following my trainings, you will understand that I've always emphasized that the computing world is a world of binary zeros and ones. So from a binary digit, you can get a BIT, binary BIT from bit digit, making a bit. So BIT is a bit. So a bit is the smallest form of data in a computer. And every character on the computer, if you look at the ASCII code, ASCII is spelled A-S-C-W-I, American Standard Code for Information Interchange. Every character on your computer, on your keyboard, has an 8-bit 
equivalent. That is combination of zeros and ones in eight places. And that makes one byte. So we say eight bits make one byte because in understanding storage, we need to understand unit of, uh, we need to understand unit of measurement. So eight bits make one byte. So two to the power of 10 make a kilobyte. And that is 1024. Where two to the power of 20 make a megabyte, as you can see on the screen. Two to the power of 30 make a gigabyte. Two to the power of 40 make a terabyte. Two to the power of 50 make a petabyte. Two to the power of 60 make an exabyte. Two to the power of 70 make a zettabyte. And two to the power of 80 make a yottabyte. And you can see the abbreviations and the equivalent if you split it down to each byte. So this is units of measuring the size of a data. And on your computer, you have what we call the primary storage and we have the secondary storage. Uh, what is the primary storage? Now, when you're working, you work basically, your processor relate with your RAM. It's your primary storage. RAM means random access memory. You can, your processor relate with it and pick data from it. When you're done and you save your data, you keep your data on the disk, any disk. Any disk, floppy disk, hard disk, or now you can even keep it on the cloud because there's provision for cloud storage now. So there are uh, 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 vendors online that all they do is to keep your file and make your file available to you at any point that you need it, at any point that you need it. So what is most of concern to you when you're saving on the cloud is how to access it and how to drop it there. So the size of the cloud provision company might actually not be your, uh, co your concern per se. So, and both on the cloud, on, on your disk, your computer can read and write. Read and write means it can take information from it. It can see it and it can also keep information there. So we have different kind of uh, disk. Like I've seen, we have hard disk. As you know, some of are uh, aware of hard disk on your on your on your computer, we have floppy disk. As you can see, this is an example of a, a system unit. You can see the motherboard, you can see chips, you can see even the hard disk where it is being slotted and kept on your disk. What are the characteristics of a disk? You can see there, it has capacity, it has platters, read and write ahead, it has cylinder, it has sector, it has track, and each of those are the characteristics of a disk. Now. Without boring you with so much details, I think I've made you understand that information are stored on disk or you saw your information on the cloud or you saw your information on the on the cloud. Now, apart from that, there's another sub of disk. Now we call it solid state drive. It's a storage device that physically uses flash memory to store data, instructions, and information. It's very reliable and is in different sizes. 3.5 inch, 2.5, 1.8. The access time is very, very fast. 80 times faster than a hard disk. The transfer rates are also very faster. It generates less heat and it consumes less power. And manufacturer, according to this author, has claimed that it can last more than 50 years, which is much greater than three to five years. That is the lifespan of an average hard disk. We also have memory cards. The memory cards are also example of storage devices via which computer stores uh, information. Your USB flash, I example, your cards, and definitely I've spoken about uh, cloud uh, storage. These are few examples of some of uh, cloud storage uh, providers uh, that provide storage provision on the cloud that make people to have access to it at any location. Most of them you subscribe to it, it's not all of them that are free. So having done with these fundamentals of understanding the hardware, that is the physical aspect of the computer, we've looked at input, storage, output, uh, processing. Let's go now into the world of software. Let's go into the world of software. Yeah, uh, I'll define the hardware as a physical aspect of the computer that can be seen, that can be felt, that can be talked down. We have looked at several examples, but now we're talking about software now. And I told you software, we have two basic groups of software, the system software and the application software. And a good example of the system software is the operating system, which control and coordinate all the activities that takes place on the computer. Aside that, we have application software. What do application software do? Application software are software that are developed for use in different areas, 
in which the use of computer can be applied. And you have plenty of them. There are very, 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 very many. We have different type of application software. Now, for operating system, you know, we have the Mac operating system, we have the Windows operating system, we have the Linux operating system, we have the Unix operating system. Depending on what you want to do and the kind of system you want to set up, that will determine the operating system that will be most fit for whatever you want to do. And I know consultants around can actually help and give you a guide and advice. Even on your phone, you have mobile operating system, you have Android, you have Apple operating system, you have Blackberry, you have Symbia, you have several kind of operating system because that operating system will be on that computing device first before any other application is allowed because the operating system serve as the interface between the system itself, all the applications on the system, and you, the user, on the other side. So it controls and coordinates all the activities that takes place on the computer. Activities such as file sharing, booting your computer, that is shutting your computer down and putting your computer on, uh, allocating size to applications, determine how application run, which one run first, system cleaning, system fragmentation, this defragmentation, all these are functions of the operating system. But for the purpose of this class, we will concentrate more on application software. Just like I said, application software are software that are developed to be used in the different areas where the use of computer can be applied. They are developed to be used in different areas where the use of computer can be applied. And if I ask, where can the use of computer be applied? This is where it's at. And that accounts for having hundreds of thousand application software for music, for game, for chatting, for teaching, for document production, for spreadsheets, for building, for design. You have an application software almost for anything. And Software developers are thinking every day and chunking more out into the market and also redefining, creating new versions for the ones that are already existing. So uh, in leading us more into the world of applications, let's look at some more other application uh, software that uh, we have. And, you know, they help us to make business activities more efficient. I've always emphasized on the word efficiency and effectiveness. We are first effective, then efficient. Efficient because we can do so much with minimal resources. The application software helped us to do a whole lot of things. Package software, web application, you can see quite a whole lot of them. What processing, stretchy, databases, presentation, uh, project management, accounting, enterprise, a computing, we have different kind of uh, application. In fact, the reason why we use the computer is basically because of applications, except for those whose work is probably systems development, software programmers, software developers, programmers, and the rest. But for others, you are on the computer, you are on your phone, you're on your computing devices, because there's an application there that I can use to do something that makes your work easier. So we're basically on our computer on a daily basis, working with one application or the other in a bid to aid our productivity, to aid our efficient effectiveness, and to aid our efficiency. Spreadsheets, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, database, all these are application software. Project management applications, MS Project, AutoCAD, all these business information modeling applications, accounting software, statistics software, SPSS, of these are all application software that aids what we'll do. And they are in different categories, desktop publishing, computer aided design, painting, editing, video, music, multimedia, all these are application software that helps to do a whole lot on a daily basis. In the legal profession, quite a whole lot. Even in meetings, all these applications we use for meetings, Zoom, uh, Google Meet, uh, all of them, Microsoft Teams that we use that enhance collaboration, all of them are also application software. So you can see how big the world of application software, the applications that help us in mapping, in direction, and eh? geographic information systems. There are several of them. So all these are application software. Having done this, let's go into the world of network and communications. 
let's go in, into the world of net and uh, communication and computer communication. Now let's explore the world of computer networks and communication. And after some time, we also look at the internet. In those days, computers can stand alone. In fact, we call them standalone computers. All the communications that happens happen within that computer itself. Happen within that computer itself. If you want your computer to connect to another computer, there are extra devices. I can remember then by network interface card, you check classic card table and be sure that you can connect it to other computers. You look for network port and things like that. Now, but today it's different. Almost all computing devices come telecommunications and communications ready. Good. What is a network? It's network if you have two or three computing devices or plus other devices to be able to talk to each other. They can connect. They can communicate. They can share information. They can share resources. What is happening in one can be sent to the other. The other can see what is happening in another, irrespective of the location. In that sense, we we'll say those computers are on a network. They are on a network because they are communicating. And there are a whole lot of things that makes that to happen. You have different kind of uh, 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 systems that make your computer to be able to communicate. You can use cable. You can use two-step peer wire, optical cable, optical fiber, and it could also use wireless. That's also another technology. You can see your infrared, your Bluetooth, all those happens without any cable. The, each of the devices emit certain signals and they can see each other. And from there, you can share file, you can share information. You can even send your job to printer without any physical cable being connected. Though, the size of the network, the carrying capacity of what will go through that network will determine whether the ones that has a cable or the one that does not have a cable that is wireless is the one that is most fit for whatever you want to do at that point in time. Now, having said that, uh, when information is uh, 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 transmitted, most times it's not transmitted the same way. For instance, if you say hello on the phone and the other guy say hi, you're fine. The voice was translated, it was converted to a means that will make it to move faster. And when it gets to the other end, it converts back to voice that the other man can hear. So the rate at which information uh, 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 move from one end to another is measured with bit per seconds. It's a measurement of transmission speed. It defines the number of uh, 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 bits that is transmitted each second. And just like I said, zeros and one, a string of eight bits, eight bits make a byte. I've said that earlier on. So that is basically what communication is. Now, as students of business, I think we need to be concerned with types of networks. Some are personal, between 20, 30 feet devices, local area network, campus area network, metropolitan area network, wide area network, global area network, depending on the distance between each of the computers. And in this case, I'll use computers and terminal interchangeably. Between each of uh, the terminals that are connecting. So the, the distance between each of them will determine the type of network that is that it is, whether it's a PAN, a LAN, CAN, MAN, W A N or G A N. Aside from that, we also have structured ways layout. We call it topology. There is star topology, there is boss topology, there is ring topology. But as students of business, I don't think I want to bore us with those details. I think what uh, is important is how do all these help us in doing business? And I know quite a whole lot of people have been using it. You can see, for instance, when all of you have one printer and the printer is connected, or you have a wireless uh, 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 laptop, a wireless system, 10 of you can use the same printer. So instead of having everybody have their different printer, you have able to save costs. You've saved costs. You've saved the number of heats that each of those print printers will be generating in the office. You've put the office in a more quiet place and an environment that is more convert, uh, conducive for, um, for business. Aside from that, you can call. Internet calls, all these are made possible 
by virtue of computer communications. All these are made possible by virtue of uh, computer communication. Now, before we discuss the enterprise archit architecture, let's quickly look at uh, the world of the internet. The internet is also an offshoot of computing devices being able to communicate, to share resources, to share information amongst themselves. And the internet itself is international network. That is network that cuts across different uh, geographical boundaries. It's called, it's called geographical boundaries. We all know we have websites, our website, I uh, have protocol that are uh, HTTP, Hypertech Transfer Protocol, because that is the protocol that guides information transfer between one system and the other. And you know, those information uh, on, on the internet are used, use hypertext. I mean, some uh, hypertext. And that's why we have HTML, hypertext markup language. That's one of the languages that is being used to write web application. So the transfer protocol is uh, uh, HTTP. A secure one is HTTPS. And also if it is file, file transfer protocol is called FTP and the secure one is FTPS. So you understand all that. And you see that when you type, uh, uh, www, uh, uh, www does whatever .com, we have HTTP there even before. So having said all this, the world of internet, we all know, we've all sent emails, we've all browsed, and we all understand what we have when we say we have a website, we have a web portal, we have web service. The website, when you type your web address, and that is why every web address is unique. When you type your web address, this, the browser here you use, you know, the browser is also an application software. What does the browser do? The browser helps users to connect files on different servers in different domains. So when you type HTTP column double slash google.com, the browser you use already know the IP address of Google. So it's going to the server where Google is domiciled and it gives you that information. You have your own copy of the information. Hundreds of users can be seen that at the same time. That's a website. Sometimes it's static when it shows you different, the same information over and over again. Sometimes it's dynamic. Probably price list, probably uh, stock market prices. You know, that changes based on what the price is at that very particular point in time. So that's a dynamic one. So when you look at IP address, IP address are also separated. You have your domain name, you have your top level domain. You can see it here. For instance, uh, google.com. The .com there is a generic top, top, level, uh, top level domain name. You have .com, .edu, .gov, uh, .net, .tel, .biz, .ng dot uk dot au all these are web address if you look at a web address it has a protocol that's http you have your domain name your main domain you have the part you have the web page name you get it as you can just see it on the on the screen so and on the internet we can do a whole lot of things there is search engine there there is learning there you can get information and i think we can overflow this so almost all if you listening to me, has been using internet at one point or the other. Having said all this, the world of hardware, input, output, storage, processing, the world of software, system software, application software, the world of computer communication, all of this, how do they help our business? And I know if you're listening to me, you might have been thinking in different ways by which this helps business help us to be very productive. It also adds its disadvantages because it can be abused. You can stay on the internet doing what you're not supposed to be doing and leaving the real thing behind untouched. So what is now the enterprise architecture? What do we mean by the enterprise architecture? From your understanding of business, every business is of different size, is of different category. Some is just a one-man business, a, li a little office, or even sometimes no office. A few clients, at some point, the business begin to grow. But while the business is growing, the man or one or two or three of them that started, they are the one carrying out all the functions of business, marketing, production, sales, HR, all business activity, finance, procurement, it's only one man or few people in a small company that are doing all that. 
when the company begin to grow, then there is proper departmentalization. You can have finance separate from production, production separate from marketing and sales, HR different, customer service different, government relations different. Now, as that grows, the company now have branches in 15 locations within the same country, but different states. And at some point, it has branches in 15, 20 country. That is becoming an enterprise, a conglomerate. At that point, you understand the importance of technology, of information and technology in communicating, in sharing files, in meetings, such that as the office, the company get bigger, things still get done faster, as if it is still small. That gap is being bridged by proper application of information and computer technology tools and resources. The speed of communication, of getting approvals, of control in large organizations that apply IT properly is very, very fast. Sometimes it's as if it is a two, three man business. Those that are still having such bottlenecks by virtue of the sizes, because some organization in business strategy, some organizations are dead. Some have declined in sales and profitability just because of their size, just because of their having more customers. But with the use of technology, ICT components and tools, you have more customers, your mind will be relaxed, you achieve so much. And there are several best book software that can help you to do that. And apart from best book, there are some other of the shelf software that can as well help you do that. So we've grown and see our organization grow. Uh, so proprietorship to limited liability company, to a public liability company, to a multinational big enterprise. So having seen all this, you can see the place of information and communication technology. And on this note, we'll end this session. Another session will be uploaded anytime soon. Thank you.